All right, so we have one small section um, for chapter 20 that we need to finish. We didn't have enough time to finish it prior to our first exam. And this is the bayer villiger oxidation. It's a pretty neat reaction. So let's take a look at it. The overall reaction can work with an aldehyde or a ketone. Um, in this case, I'm just showing a generic ketone, but we'll take a look at what happens um, when we vary that. And what we're going to do is we're going to react it with this generic reagent. This is a peroxy acid. We've actually seen peroxy acids before. Does anybody remember the main peroxy acid we've seen a lot of? MCPBA. So MCPBA is a proxy acid too. It's not the same as a carboxylic acid. In particular, it's got this oxygen-oxygen single bond, um, and it's quite reactive because of that. The cool thing is, in this reaction, one of those oxygen atoms will be inserted. So you can start out with an aldehyde or a ketone, and you can actually convert it to an ester or a carboxylic acid. So let's take a look at that in a bit more detail. So let's say we have this aldehyde. This is acetaldehyde. And we treat this with a proxy acid. What happens is the oxygen will insert in between this carbon-hydrogen bond. And you can actually directly oxidize an aldehyde all the way to a carboxylic acid. You could also go from that aldehyde to the carboxylic acid using another reagent we've seen. Think back to our oxidation chapter. What was our super strong oxidant? Chromic acid. Why might we use this instead of chromic acid? Yeah, it doesn't have chromium, which will give you cancer, right? So it's a pretty good alternative. Yeah, good word about cancer. All right. Let's take a look at ketones. Ketones are kind of the example we saw up above. If you have a ketone with the proxy acid, you'll immediately go to the ester. So it does depend on the ketone, and we'll talk more about that later. So the question is, which side will the oxygen insert into, the left-hand side or the right-hand side? For this specific example, it doesn't really matter, but for other examples, it does matter. But either way, you're going to go from a ketone um, to an ester during this transformation. All right, so let's take a look at the overall mechanism. <coughs> And I'm going to just stick with a ketone for this example. So we'll go with the ketone shown above. And I'm going to show our peroxy acid in a specific orientation that will make the mechanism a bit easier to draw out. And if we think about that aldehyde, we know that it's nice and electrophilic. Question is, what position do you think will act as the nucleophile in our proxy acid? We've got some lone pairs all over the place. We've got these lone pairs, got these lone pairs, and we've got these lone pairs. Do you think it's likely the lone pairs on the carbonyl are going to attack? No, probably not super likely. All right, now the question is, do you think the lone pairs indicated in red will attack or blue? Which ones are more available to be attacked? Blue, blue right? The red ones are delocalized. So that's a big clue right there, <coughs> that these lone pairs will attack in and kick up electrons. It's a bit weird, right? Um, students will often say, but you just showed me before that alcohols won't attack into carbonyls unless they're protonated. Um, however, you can see what happens pretty quickly in the next step. Right now, let me actually show all of our lone pairs. We've got three lone pairs on that oxygen. And we've got this peroxy acid group kind of dangling off the side with a positive charge there, two lone pairs here, and two lone pairs there. You kind of following that? Mm 
All right. Now in the next step, what's going to happen is a bit weird. This is the tricky part. What happens is this carbonyl oxygen will actually reach over and grab that proton. Why do you think that's allowed? <laughs> Not quite. It actually has to do with the ring size. So in this case, it can occur intramolecularly because it's not super strained trying to reach that proton. So that's the main one that's um, proposed. So let's take a look at our next intermediate. All right, so now we've got a positive charge, got lone pairs all around. Looks like that. All right, so at this point, we've got this really, really weak oxygen-oxygen single bond in the molecule. Those proxy bonds like that um, tend to be quite unstable. The next part is weird. What happens is this entire alkyl group is going to migrate or shift. And during this migration, a sequence of events happens. This bond is kicked down. This whole bond is going to be kicked over onto this oxygen, meaning that entire methyl group is going to slide over onto one of those oxygens. And then this single bond is going to slide over. And then we're going to kick electrons up there. So this is arguably one of the most complicated mechanisms we've seen so far. We normally don't invoke methyl groups shifting around like that with the exception of rearrangements. This is kind of the weird exception beyond rearrangements. All right, so now when this is all done, we've got the oxygen here. The methyl group slid over onto that oxygen on the right-hand side. And now we've got to kind of figure out what's going on with this remaining chunk over here, right? So that's the chunk that essentially fell off as a leaving group. So we can even describe this as a leaving group. Well, we know that this chunk, we formed an oxygen-carbon single bond. Up here, we broke that double bond and made it a single bond. And we have a bond to that hydrogen. And then over here, we have that R group. Does that make sense? So over here, we made our ester product. And then this chunk right here was our leaving group. And in this case, our leaving group is quite stable because it just falls apart as a carboxylic acid. Does that make sense? All right, so it does get tricky. Like I said, um, this group that I circled in orange migrated over. So this shifts over. So now the question is, well, why did that methyl group and the other methyl group, or why did this methyl group shift over the other one? In reality, either of them can. It would give you the exact same product. But let's say we have an unsymmetric group. So maybe one of those groups coming off that carbon is a methyl group, and the other one's an ethyl group. How would we know which one shifts? Um, really, that was determined experimentally. So let's take a look at the experimental observations. So we'll take a look at what groups prefer to shift over to that oxygen in that step shown above. So the first one is hydrogens really love to shift. So hydrogens, if you have that available, meaning you have an aldehyde, that's going to shift over, which is exactly what I showed you up above. You see how we had an aldehyde and we inserted in between the carbon-hydrogen bond and not the carbon-carbon bond? We always get a carboxylic acid. All right, so that's the highest priority. And then next highest is a tertiary carbon. And you can imagine why, right? So tertiary groups are more stabilized um, if we were to move them over in their transition state. Followed by secondary carbons. And then here's where things get interesting followed by phenyl groups. One would think a phenyl group would go higher than a tertiary group, right? Because it would be resonance stabilized. Not quite. 
This is kind of the oddball exception, and we just know this based on experimental observation. I don't really have an answer for you beyond that. All right, and then we go to primary, and then we go to methyl. So yeah, this surprised me. Like I said, I would have expected this phenyl group to be way up higher, um, but it's kind of in the middle. My guess is it's a combo of stability and sterics, right? Because the phenyl group's pretty large to move, um, so I think that's personally why it's not um, readily shifted. Does that make sense? All right, so let's show you some other cool examples of this reaction. And this comes into play primarily in the pharmaceutical industry. So what's this ketone called? <coughs> Not everybody all at once. I don't want you to talk over one another. Cyclopentanone, right? So it's cyclopentanone. And so we can have RCO3H. That's just a condensed version of the proxy acid, so you might see these written down a lot, right? All right, so what do you think will happen? Does it matter which side the oxygen's getting inserted into? No. No, but we are going to expand the ring. Right? Because we didn't gain or lose carbons, the ring's actually going to get one member bigger because of that inserted oxygen. This is a cyclic ester, often known as a lactone. Lactones are pretty common in the pharmaceutical industry, and it's also nice um, to have as an intermediate, right? Because what will happen if we treat this with LAH in excess, followed by water? Yeah, we would get an alcohol, right? And in this case, we would get an alcohol that looks like this. Right, so we could actually ring open this lactone, or if we wanted to, we could treat this with methyl magnesium bromide in excess, followed by water. And if we were to do that, same sort of idea, we know with esters that Grignards will add in multiple times. and we can do a ring opening reaction. Can we do a ring opening reaction directly with this? Not really. We would first have to convert it to the lactone and then ring open it. So this allows us to ring open cyclic uh, molecules, which is pretty handy. Does that make sense? All right, so let's try some practice. This could be on the next exam. I know you're thinking, we just got done with an exam. Stop talking about that. All right? <laughs> so let's think about this one. Let's think about this one. We'll just rattle off a few. So let's try to predict what the product would look like for each of these. I'll give this a hint right here. Give me a thumbs up if you feel pretty confident. A few people? 
So let's walk through this slowly. And this is something that confuses people. Clearly, we've got a hydrogen on this side, so we know that the oxygen is going to be inserted there, and we'll get a carboxylic acid. But let's describe what this carbon is. Is that tertiary, secondary, primary, or methyl? It gets tricky, right? Think about it this way. We're treating this as an entire group, and we're saying this carbon is attached to how many other carbons going off on that group? Primary. So this would qualify as a primary <coughs> carbon. And this confuses students because they're like, but that carbon's attached to two carbons. But really, we're asking how many other carbons going further is it attached to. So this would be verse primary versus a methyl, or sorry, primary versus a hydrogen. And we know that it prefers to insert between a carbon-hydrogen bond than a carbon-carbon bond. So we'd get this carboxylic acid. Pretty easy, right? Same thing with the next one over here. What would that be? Secondary. Over here, we've got a hydrogen. It's the same sort of idea. All right, and then over here, now we've got a decision to make. What's this one? A methyl, right? Because it's not attached to any other carbons as we move out from it, so that'd be a methyl group. And then over here, we have a secondary carbon. So now the question is, are we going to insert the oxygen where that red arrow is located, or are we going to insert the oxygen where the blue arrow is located? Red. So I would prefer to be on the other side in this case. So in this case, we would get an ester. Does that make sense? So students sometimes get confused. We had three carbons in that isopropyl group, right? We still have that isopropyl group, but now the oxygen's been inserted between it and the CO double bond. Yeah, it's kind of nice, though, because this opens up the door towards all the ester reactions we've seen before. And then this next chapter will cover all the carboxylic acid reactions. So it's a valuable tool. Yep. Is the size of the two cells So are you saying what if you have a secondary versus secondary? Yeah, so in this case, the order priorities matters, right? If we, let's say, change this to a primary carbon, we know that secondary groups still will shift preferentially over a primary group. It does get tricky if, let's say, you have uh, a primary versus a different primary group. Then the question is, well, which one prefers to move? <coughs> the reality is you'll likely get a big mix of products. Yep. Oh, it would still be a secondary carbon. What we're always looking at is that attachment point to the carbonyl, so right? The of the yeah. The length of the chain coming off of that group doesn't really matter. All we care about is that highlighted carbon is secondary. It's attached to two other groups as you move out. Yeah. If it's a tie between secondary and secondary, yeah. should you draw both products? Yeah, so if it's a primary primary tie or a secondary secondary tie, it would be a good idea to draw both potential products. Um, they might not be in a perfect 50 50 ratio. That can be hard to tell. That has a lot to do with sterics, meaning um, how bulky is it to move it around. But that can be pretty complicated to figure out um, exactly what ratio and what percentage it would be in. Make sense? All right, so that's the last um, reaction from chapter 20. We just didn't have time to cover it before the exam. Um, if you remember, at the end of each chapter, it has these reaction summaries. This is a pretty heavy duty chapter in terms of content. Um, that last reaction I showed you is, I think, arguably the most unique, along with the Wolf Kishner reduction. If you remember, the Wolf Kishner reduction was this one down here. Um, the Wittig reaction was also kind of unique. The other ones tended to follow the same sort of general arrow pushing.
which we're going to see a lot going into this next chapter as well, which is kind of handy in my opinion. Um, just make sure that when you practice, you practice a lot of arrow pushing and book problems too. Um, that's honestly how you get good at these, is just doing the mechanisms over and over and over again. Make sense? 